record. Um, so good morning and welcome to our second installment of Outspor Explore Your Outdoors with the Utah Society for Environmental Ed. Um, my name is Alex Papora and I'm the Executive Director of UC and I am so delighted to have us be joined this morning by Jamie Butler from the Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster who's going to share some really amazing, um, exciting, funny, delightful facts about the Great, great Salt Lake. Um, before we get started, just a couple uh, quick um, reminders and things. I know many of us have participated on a number of these calls, but if you haven't, um, we're here to help you navigate this interface to make your experience uh, much more pleasant. Um, just as an FYI, we'll be recording so we can share this on YouTube and our social channels later. Um, please stay muted. I'll show you how to do that in a moment if you don't know how. And I will also show you how to type questions in the chat box. Um, you can also feel free to leave your camera off. You can turn it on if you'd like to ask a question and we're happy to um, take questions throughout this presentation. So here's how to do all that stuff. Uh, your interface is kind of this, this box. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner is a mute button. So you can click that. Um, once it has a slash through it, it means that you're muted. Right next to it is a video icon. Clicking on that will turn your video off and on. Um, the chat icon, which is a little bit further to the right on your bar, that will open up a chat box where you can type your question. And what I can do um, is I'll be sure to read all of the questions so everybody can hear that question that's asked. So if you don't have your chat box open, um, please know that we will read that question. Um, then if you see a reaction button, you can also click there to virtually uh, clap or give a thumbs up if what you hear sounds pretty cool. So that's how you navigate navigate Zoom. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to tap them and type them in the chat box. And uh, don't hesitate if you feel like you have a question that seems dumb. Granted, somebody else probably has that question too. So don't hesitate to ask. So just some quick background on UC. Who are we? Why are we hosting uh, the, these events? Why are we so invested in getting people uh, to explore the outdoors? Um, we are the Utah State Affiliate of the North American Association for Environmental Education. And what we do in the state is we work to elevate the field of environmental education in Utah. We do that through a variety of ways, through our annual conference, which re reaches up to 100 educators a year, which then have an impact on the students and youth that they work with. Our awards and recognition program highlighting um, exemplary work in the field of environmental education, professional development for educators, much of which has moved online. Um, so we're always happy to connect you with resources if you're looking for virtual ways to continue uh, learning about the environment. And then of course, advocating for sound environmental education policy, both locally and nationally. We also wanted to remind people that right now, many of us are feeling kind of cooped up, but the outdoors isn't canceled. So we do wanna encourage you today to spend some time outdoors, but please remember to do so safely and responsibly. I also wanted to share that yesterday, the governor announced that most of our state parks are back open for all residents of the state. Um, there are some restrictions, most, mostly in parks um, on the eastern side of Utah, but places like Antelope Island are open again for all residents of the state. You don't just have to be a resident um, of the county in which the park is in. So if you're itching to get outside, I think today's gonna be a lovely day. Great opportunity um, to spend some time visiting our state parks. And we do have, have two more talks coming up um, in May. Um, these will likely again be on Zoom, maybe fingers crossed for our, our June talk to be outdoors with some social distancing. Um, in May, we'll be joined by artist Susan Snyder for some really great tips and tricks on nature journaling and how to find your bliss outdoors. And then June 13th, we'll connect with Amy Horman from the Jordan River Commission to meet your neighborhood river, the Jordan River. Um, we are are also really glad to thank, even though we are not able to be there in person today, our partner Tracy Aviary and the Jordan River Nature Center. Uh, hop on your bike, take a ride past there and see that beautiful nature center along the Jordan River. And we're also really thankful to Salt Lake County's Do Arts and Parks for supporting this event. 
So without further ado, I'm going to toss things over to Jamie Butler um, with the Great Salt Lake Institute to share more about the great Great Salt Lake. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm Jamie Butler. I work at Westminster College and I run an organization called Great Salt Lake Institute. Um, I'm a total obsessed nerd about Great Salt Lake. Um, there's a few of us that I see on here that are the same. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Great Salt Lake. And I've really concentrated my talk on places where you can go. Um, and really, you know, our mission at Great Salt Lake Institute is to connect people to the lake through research and education. So um, please, um, it, like this group is, um, I know many of you that are on here. And so please like jump in and ask me questions as we're going along because um, it'll be a lot more fun. So I'm going to share my screen with you and get started because uh oh there we go because i want to tell you more about the great great salt lake um and here's an image of great salt lake and we can look at it and see its different colors and it's broken up into different spaces um here we can see all of our highways and get oriented to where salt lake is and where ogden is and here's Brigham City up here. And um, you know, one of the places that we can go visit are our wetlands, the Nature Conservancy and the Division of Wildlife Resources has many places where you can go visit wetlands and see um, where all of our snowpack ends up and see these places that are really like the filtration system of the um, Great Salt Lake watershed where all of the water enters into Great Salt Lake these wetlands, you know, anything with Great Salt Lake, I'm gonna talk about salinity or the salt content of Great Salt Lake throughout this whole conversation. And um, um, salinity is really the driving factor for what can live in the different parts of Great Salt Lake. The wetlands are anywhere from zero to 3% salinity. And when we talk about salinity, you know, some people might not, might not have like an idea of what that really means, but um, you know, we a lot of us have tasted salt uh, seawater from the ocean. The ocean seawater is about three point five percent salinity on average. So, um, you know, these wetlands are anywhere from zero to three percent salinity, and these wetlands support a huge variety of um, water birds and shorebirds. And we don't have to get you know stuck up in what kind of like birds these are, but I want you to pay attention to all of these. My my friend Ella Sorensen that works for National Audubon calls these superlatives of the largest breeding populations of gadwalls, 75% um, of Western populations of tundra, tundra swans. Wilson's phalaropes has the largest staging concentrations. Um, Godwits and California gulls are the largest breeding site. Great Salt Lake is the largest breeding site for California gulls. And we'll talk about pelicans later because I never really shut up about pelicans. And of course, you know, our avocets with their beautiful upturned beaks and their orange heads and their blue legs. So outside of the wetlands, we have Gilbert Bay or the south arm of Great Salt Lake that is south of the railroad causeway. The salinity is much higher um, than the wetlands, anywhere from nine to 15%. So five times saltier than ocean water. And obviously lots of different things can live in the south arm of Great Salt Lake compared to the wetlands. Um, the uh, microscopic community is composed of many green algaes. These um, beautiful little diatoms that are covered with a silica shell kind of like glass and even euglena that are ciliated and they have um, these cool little cilia that propel them through the water. These, these algaes and phytoplankton and little um, little micro microscopic organisms, they feed the brine shrimp of Great Salt Lake. And many of you have heard me talk about brine shrimp. They were my first love at Great Salt Lake, which sounds really, really, really weird to say I love something like brine shrimp. Um, they um, do this really cool dance. 
you can pretend like they're um, like dancing. And they're also known as sea monkeys. Um, sea monkeys were marketed as instant life by um, an educational organization. Um, they're actually a different species. Artemia neos is what they call them. Ours are Artemia franciscana. And they're about a half an inch long. Um, the cool thing about these brine shrimp is, I mean, Great Salt Lake is exactly perfect for their their life. Um, they're adapted to Great Salt Lake. And sometimes in Great Salt Lake, there's the same amount of biomass in brine shrimp. So the same amount of weight in brine shrimp as 1.8 million people all at one time. And, and that's an incredible food resource, right? And they have this really cool, um, they have this very cool life cycle where um, in right before the winter starts, um, they the females lay these dormant cysts that are covered in a keratin shell. And you can kind of think of them as an M&M with a soft embryonic center and a hard outside shell. And those shells allow these branch shrimp to survive over the winter. In the springtime, they hatch into these little, these are called nauplii. These are about 250 microns. And you can see how tiny these little cysts are on the tip of um, Ty Harrison's finger. Ty Harrison was a faculty member at Westminster College. Um, when they hatch out, this is actually why people harvest them. We'll talk about this later, but these little nauplii are fish food. They feed prawns and fish across the world, um, which is a really important food resource for humans, um, especially, you know, emerging as, as our human populations are growing so fast. Um, growing these fish in, um, you know, dense managed um, situations is very important. And then um, these brine shrimp, they have about three generations, four generations over the summer, and they have to um, grow into these juveniles. And, you know, they have, they're an invertebrate, right? So they have this exoskeleton that they shed, and then they grow into these adults. Our shrimp are sexually reproducing, and that means that there's both males and females in the population. Old world shrimp in like Russia and China, they're, um, a lot of them are parthenogenic, so they um, reproduce by cloning themselves in their brood sac. And if you were to take a handful of brain shrimp out of their lakes, you would mostly find females, hardly any males. People harvest brine shrimp. Um, it's a really big industry and it's actually how I started um, working at Great Salt Lake. Um, it was like my real first job. And people go out there in these small airplanes and they scout Great Salt Lake because our cysts float on the surface of Great Salt Lake. These cysts or these brine shrimp eggs, they look like an oil slick and the brine shrimp harvesters refer to them as a slick. And um, people race, it's very competitive and people race. Like you'll notice out here, there's 500 horsepower and this boat is going 50 miles an hour or more along the surface of Great Salt Lake. And they um, deploy their, their permit and then they bring these big 50 to 70 foot long, 75 foot long boats out um, and they deploy oil containment boom. This oil containment boom is, I mean, exactly what you would do in an oil spill. It's like a sheet of plastic that floats on the surface of Great Salt Lake and they can corral all of these brine shrimp cysts um, with these oil containment booms and then they pump them through vacuum pumps onto these giant boats. Um, each one of these bags, these are filter bags, and these filter bags each hold about two tons of brine shrimp cysts. Um, last, year, last year alone, I think they harvested about 42 million pounds of cysts off of the surface of Great Salt Lake, which um, provides um, a, a lot of like economic benefit to the um, state of Utah. But it's not just humans that use brine shrimp, right? There's all of these 10 million birds that come to Great Salt Lake and migrate here to refuel and rest and reproduce. And eared grebes are one of them. Um, eared grebes are these awesome little birds and they eat primarily brine shrimp. 
And you'll notice, you know, their beak is kind of sharp and pointy. It's not like a pelican bill that would like scoop up large numbers at a time. And each one of these eared greeds has to eat between 22,000 and 30,000 brine shrimp every day that they pick out of the water individually. Eared greeds are super cool too because they, when they come to Great Salt Lake, kind of in the late summer to the fall, they um, they molt and lose their ability to fly and they gain so much weight and put all of their energy into their digestive system that they can't, they can't fly anymore. All they do is they dive and they eat these brine shrimp all day long. They have to catch a brine shrimp every two seconds to maintain their weight um, to stay healthy. Last year alone, um, there was about 5 million eared grebes that came to Great Salt Lake. There's so many grebes that come to Great Salt Lake that you can see them flying um, on weather radar. So these are eared grebes that are leaving Great Salt Lake in um, huge, huge, huge numbers over you know, a three week period. Sometimes you might find dead birds on the shoreline and people, it seems like every spring I get these emails or these phone calls that are like, Great Salt Lake is killing our birds. And really it's not. If you see birds at Great Salt Lake that are um, dead birds or skeletons on the shoreline, you know, if 5 million eared grebes alone comes to Great Salt Lake and just a small number dies because of natural causes, you have a huge number of birds that end up on the shoreline pickled and preserved. They pickle in the salt just and preserved with that salt, just like we do with our food. And they dry, they desiccate in the hot summer sun. And you'll see their um, carcasses on the shoreline. Um, and it is a little unnerving, but it also reminds me of how much life is at Great Salt Lake and how much life Great Salt Lake really supports. So you, if you live in Salt Lake County, um, when I prepared my talk, we were still like on total shutdown of parks. But um, if you live in Salt Lake County, you might live next to Great Salt Lake Park and Saltair. Um, it's just a couple exits on I-80 past the airport. So it's very close for us to visit. Um, and I think it's a very interesting place. So there's um, the marina. Um, the marina has um, lots of sailboats. It's the only place right now that has sailboats. There's a marina that you can take kayaks out of and a boat ramp. And, you know, there is this, the Great Salt Lake Yacht Club that is a very vibrant um, community of sailors that, that enjoy Great Salt Lake. There's also salt air. So you might know Saltaire um, because of this funny building that, that sits um, right close to the Great Salt Lake Marina. And I know, you know, when I was, what, 25 or something, I went to a Primus concert there. People go to the concerts. It's a music venue now. It didn't used to be a mus uh, just a music venue. It was actually this, like, huge resort that um, there was a train line that came from Salt Lake City, and people would float, and um, people would dance. It had the, one of the largest um, uh, dance floors in the world. And, you know, since then, there um, has been a couple of fires. There's actually been three saltaires. This saltaire is saltaire number three. This is saltaire number one, and you can see these like bathing houses. Um, and it was, you know, sometimes on the weekend, there would be 10,000 people that would come out there to socialize. Um, the new Saltair 3 is now in a different location, but you can also like go check out the beaches where the old Saltair was. And you might find things like glasses that were discarded. This is like a pint glass and you can kind of see this purple hue to this, this glass. We know because of that purple hue, there's manganese in the glass and um, archaeologists that are working to document the old salt parasite know that that glass was made between 1880 and 1920. You might find plates. Um, and there's this cool like flu that used to, it was like a pipe, this wooden pipe that kind of looks like, you know, a whiskey barrel that's held together with all of these, um, you know, metal supports. Um, this actually brought water, salt water, both to the swimming areas of salt air 
and also to the salt evaporation companies that evaporated salt out, uh, that evaporated the water to create salt. Um, this area, like I would highly encourage everybody to go out to this area. It's um, so interesting and flat and open and there's not a lot of people, which we all worry about right now. Um, but it is an active archaeological site, and so if you find anything, don't don't take it home. Take pictures of it, look at it, and replace it where you found it. Um, after this is over, um, I because um, I'm not an expert in the archaeology of Saltair, the Utah State Historic Preservation Office has been doing a lot of um, documentation of this site, and they have this really great video that they put with information all about Saltair. Um, if you do go out there, watch for these cute little birds. These are snowy plovers. I mean, snowy plovers, they're, you know, little tiny birds about this big, and they nest on the mud flats. You'll see um, you, their eggs are very cryptic. You can hardly see them. So if you do go out there in the springtime, make sure to put a leash on your dogs because um, they can damage these nests. And snowy plovers, are um, a species of concern threatened, considered threatened in some areas. So um, please enjoy them, but put your dogs on a leash. Oh, they're so cute. Look at them. They look like little cotton balls on stilts when they're babies. And when you see them on the beach, you'll kind of go out and you'll, you'll um, you know, think nothing's out there. And then all of a sudden the beach comes alive with these like little like cotton balls on stilts. We probably, many of us have heard of Antelope Island. It's a Utah State Park, um, and actually one of the fastest growing um, parks in the Utah State system. Um, Antelope Island is home to both pronghorn antelope, um, and one of my favorite parts of Antelope Island is actually the causeway. So the causeway that you drive on to Antelope Island, is um, a great place to go watch birds. And I would in particular tell you, this is a great time to go out there in the next month during migration season. And also it's um, the noceum season for all of Great Salt Lake. And noceums are these little teeny tiny biting bugs that are like the worst thing ever that you've ever, seen. you don't even see them, you just feel them um, biting you. And, um, they drink, you know, their like pre-bled cocktail is DEET. DEET doesn't help keep them away, like insect repellent doesn't keep them away. And so right now driving the causeway and staying in the confines of your car and taking your binoculars and watching birds is a really great way to enjoy um, Great Salt Lake right now. Um, there's also bison. Um, there's um, anywhere between 500 and 750 bison that um, um, were, so 13 bison were put on um, Antelope Island back in the day. And the Mormon church used to use it as their kind of like, like safe space to keep their stock, their cows. And you can go look at the Fielding Gar Ranch and see this like really interesting kind of Old West situation. Um, right now, bison, um, there's about, um, they try to keep it to about 500 bison, but every year there's between 200 and 250 bison that are um, born on, on um, Antelope Island that are then auctioned off and used as stock herds for, um, people who raise bison for meat or um, they also use it as like a genetic stock for other plate for um, wild herds. Oh, there's also flies. So you'll see flies at Great Salt Lake, both at um, the Great Salt Lake Marina and Saltaire and at Antelope Island. And um, they're also like brown shrimp in incredible numbers. And these flies are food for, for lots of birds. You'll see these gulls that um, do this behavior called gaping where they just open their mouth and they just run through clouds of brine flies. Brine flies are um, one of two, um, in addition to the brine shrimp, the larvae live their, um, their, their larval form is in the waters of Great Salt Lake. And they look like little worms that are about this long, like half an inch long or so. And they scour the benthic, they're the bottom 
parts of Great Salt Lake and they just munch and munch and munch along these bottom parts of Great Salt Lake. And then they pupate um, and go through complete metamorphosis like a butterfly. So you could call them Great Salt Lake butterflies. Um, not everybody thinks of them like a butterfly. Um, and then after they pupate on the bottom of Great Salt Lake, they hatch into these brine flies that then come into the terrestrial environment. Um, in again, incredible, incredible numbers. And oftentimes when you're at Great Salt Lake, you might see rows of these pupa cases that kind of look like little worms, um, or worm cases. That's what those are. You might have heard about this railroad causeway. So we built this railroad causeway and it used to be wood. It was made of old growth dug fir. They probably cleared, my friend Brent Olson at Westminster, he um, thinks they cleared about two, um, two square miles of old growth dug fir to make this railroad causeway. But the thing is, is this sits on the bottom of Lake Bonneville and all of these sediments have come into this like terminal basin. So they've been brought into this place and um, it creates this very unstable and kind of gushy bottom to great salt, goopy bottom is a better way to put it on the bottom. And so in order to um, make this railroad causeway that was built across Great Salt Lake, um, to, to save time and money instead of going all the way around the north part of Great Salt Lake. They filled in this causeway um, with, with rock. And what it did is it made the causeway impermeable to water flow. And so in the south arm of Great Salt Lake, um, the, all of the water enters into the south arm of Great Salt Lake and makes it a lower salinity, that 12 to 15% salinity. And where there's no fresh water input into the north arm of Great Salt Lake, the salt content has built up and so it's saturated with salt. You can't make the water any saltier than it is. So it's a very like extreme environment of 10 times saltier than seawater. Um, probably a lot of you have been to Spiral Jetty. I know my friend Wendy Roberts is on here. I actually met her at Spiral Jetty. Um, Spiral Jetty is an earthwork that was built by an artist named Robert Smithson. And he was part of this, um, the kind of beginning of the environmental movement where people were trying to get people, people were trying to get people outside of museums and into places that they wouldn't normally go. And Robert Smithson, he was looking for a place that had pink water and white shorelines and black rocks. And there's not very many places in the world that are like that. So Spiral Jetty is built on the bed of Great Salt Lake in 1970. And it, it's, it's um, 1,500 feet long and extends 1,000 feet um, into the bed of Great Salt Lake. And it's one of the only places that you can see these halophiles, these salt loving archaea and bacteria that thrive, that it's this perfect environment for these um, microbes and they're colored orange or red or pink or yellow. Um, to protect themselves and protect their nucleus from the salt and the sun and um, all of this extreme environment. If you culture them, they look like this, you know, orange and, you know, pinks. Um, and we actually study these, um, Dr. Bonnie Baxter, who is the director of Great Salt Lake Institute, she studies these microorganisms as an analog for what might live on Mars. So Great Salt Lake also has this really cool connection to Mars and NASA gives us money to study these because you know, Mars has this really salty environment that used to have water on it. And these um, microorganisms can get kind of encapsulated um, and become dormant. Um, and so the next Mars 2020 rover that's gonna go out is gonna have um, technology that was created with the help of um, students from Westminster and um, studying here at the Spiral Jetty. 
And we all know that because Great Salt Lake is salty, it has so much dissolved solids, it, um, it makes everything very buoyant. And this is my husband with our 40 pound border collie that's just floating effortlessly in this 30% salt water at Spiral Jetty and pink. It's like pink lemonade. It's like nothing that I could ever describe unless you've seen it. Um, and there's and and there's this connection. So Gunnison Island isn't a place that you can visit. Um, Gunnison Island is protected for the birds that live at Great Salt Lake. And um, on Gunnison Island, um, that's a very kind of desolate place in the middle of this very salty Great Salt Lake. There's no trees out there. There's some sagebrush. It's mostly grass that's out there. There's American white pelicans. So it's one of the largest populations of American uh, uh, breeding American white pelicans. Usually 11,000 pelicans nest on Gunnison Island and there are about 5,000 babies that are born every year on Gunnison Island. But you might wonder because um, you probably are like, hey, what do pelicans eat out there though? They don't eat grass, they don't eat microorganisms, pink microorganisms. And so these pelicans have to fly all the way from Gunnison Island to the freshwater wetlands on the east side of Great Salt Lake. Um, a few years ago, we were lucky enough to partner with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and their Great Salt Lake Ecosystem um, Program. And also Tracy Aviary provided us the financial means to put cameras on Gunnison Island. And so this bay that you're looking at, this is called Lamborn Bay. And you'll notice there are these groups of pelicans that are hanging out. These are nesting American white pelicans. This camera shot can be found live at gslpeliproject.org. Um, and you can watch these pelicans that are nesting. But at the same time that we put this live camera out there, um, we knew that it was kind of this long range shot and you couldn't really get a good look at these pelicans. And so we put some motion activated cameras on the island and the images are hilarious that we're finding out there. These are pelicans that are landing. Um, and I think this is really cool because they look very, um, you know, they're very funny looking and they don't look very graceful, but actually pelicans um, connect, you know, they catch thermals that rise off of um, the, the mountains and like the topography around Great Salt Lake and they can gain altitudes of 30,000 feet. Um, and they're very efficient flyers, which is what they do. They are flying to these freshwater wetlands from Gunnison Island and they are catching fish in these freshwater wetlands and they bring them back to their babies, which is very energetically expensive. So this is 30 miles each way from Gunnison Island to these close freshwater wetlands. Some fly even farther. Um, these pelicans, they take selfies. Um, this is a baby pelican that was exploring one of our cameras one day. Um, pelicans, we've also been watching, you know, their behaviors. And I think this is a very interesting picture and reminds me of like car rides with my kids. Like I try to keep my kids about like exactly two arm lengths apart. That's how pelicans nest. You can measure the nest, the distance between nests, and you'll see there's two beak lengths apart between each pelican nest. These pelicans come, um, we can watch pelicans fly in. Um, this is early in the spring and you'll notice there's this little hump on its bill um, or horn. Um, when the pelicans are horny, it means they're breeding pelicans. And um, these pelicans, when they're nesting, you'll see all of a sudden this horn it falls right off of their beak during the nesting season. Um, you'll see these pelicans in these images laying eggs. You'll see them having, you'll see these little teeny tiny little babies. Um, pelicans, they, they don't bring fish back in their bill like that silly song says. They actually take this, these fish and they swallow them into their belly. Um, and they regurgitate food to their young, um, which, 
which doesn't seem very pleasant to me. I'm glad I don't have to like regurgitate food to my babies because um, these babies literally put their entire beak down their parents' throat once they get, I mean, this, this young is probably ready to fledge and will fly soon and is almost as big as the adult. But this is what's scary is, you know, we've been diverting water from Great Salt Lake for over a hundred years and now there's land bridges and these pelicans have um, captured coyotes going on to Gunnison Island and probably more scary are people. People are, um, pelicans are very shy and if they see any disturbance like people or, or coyotes, um, they will entirely abandon their nesting colony. And we know from watching them over the past, um, the Utah Division of Wildlife doing research and counting these pelicans, we know that since these coyotes arrived in um, 2017, that our pelican populations have um, de decreased and the number of pelicans that are breeding on Gunnison Island. And, you know, I think the scary part and the part that bums me out the most is that like, and I know our lake is super dynamic and the Great Salt Lake is built to be dynamic and that's how all of our plants and all of our animals have like adapted over time is to this change. Um, but you can see how dramatically, you know, from the 1980s to 2016, you can see just how dramatically all of this, um, ecosystem has changed. It's about 40%. It's decreased by about 40%. And you'll see, you know, all of these shorelines and those shorelines and those mud flats and those salt flats, um, they can, um, dust can, can be um, blown off of those shorelines and not only into our human environment, but also into our snowpack. And when it lands on our snowpack, it, um, creates, it, it uh, makes the snow melt faster because of that dark color. And so um, I know lots of you, but um, you know, if, if you want more information, um, I direct, I coordinate Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College, and we can be found at greatsaltlakeinstitute.org or on social media at GSL Institute. Um, if you're a teacher out there, many, we work with lots of teachers. This is on our website where you can find some especially robust um, sixth grade curriculum, um, but there's also lots of other activities and ideas for you to do. All of the 500,000 Pelican pictures can be found on Zooniverse. And even if you don't want to analyze Pelican pictures, Zooniverse is this awesome resource for people-powered research where you can translate um, old World War III um, papers. You can um, help researchers look at um, like microbes. Um, there's like astronomy on Zooniverse, but I would prefer you go to the Pelicams and help us analyze all of those images. Um, and there's tutorials and um, you know, researchers that are connecting with people personally. Um, Dr. Bonnie Baxter and myself, we wrote a book called The Great, Great Salt Lake Monster Mystery, and um, we did that under um, the Great Salt Lake Salty Sirens because we feel like we um, try to lure people into Great Salt Lake. And you can find us um, also at GSL Salty Sirens on social media. We have tons of like nerd attire, brine shrimp, scarves, um, tea towels, um, funny little rusty shrimp that you can put in your plants. And then for all of you extreme nerds out there in, I think it's now um, pushed back to July because of our world events, but we have edited a 16 chapter book on Great Salt Lake bi biology and a terminal lake in a time of change because um, you know, we're really looking right now at, you know, I've told you about these water diversions that have taken water out of Great Salt Lake, but we aren't really even seeing um, huge effects of climate change yet. And so, you know, we really wanted to not just tell about the history of Great Salt Lake, but we wanted to talk about this lake in this time of change. 
And, you know, finally, you know, there's 22,000 square miles of water that is, you know, emptying into Great Salt Lake. And that's this like huge important part of like our entire um, ecosystem, not in just Utah, but also parts of Idaho and Wyoming. And so um, we feel like this, it's this really great, great place to, you know, talk about this lake and the effects of water on Great Salt Lake. So I'm done blabbing and blabbing and blabbing. And if you want to ask me any questions, I would love to take questions. Or comments. Or we can all just go drink more coffee. <laughs> oh, we've got one question in from Katie. Um, so how bad are the bugs right now if we go out to the lake? Okay, so the um, I've heard Antelope Island is not very bad right now. Um, and the bugs will go from, you know, like April until early July, depending on what the air temperatures do. Um, so I wouldn't worry about the bugs too bad. And I'll give you some advice. The bugs live in like the sagebrush and the plants. They don't come out of the water of Great Salt Lake. So if you can get away from like sagebrush, if you can like get out onto the beaches and like the flat, very open areas, um that's that's the best right now um but i just you know the springtime i i think that the fall is the best time to visit great salt lake because of the bugs and also you know the brine shrimp are just starting to hatch the birds start really like migrating in full force in may so um i like i like to take car rides when the bugs are bad and look at the birds I actually have a question. So with last year being the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike, um, has there been like increased visitation to places like Spiral Jetty and the North Arm or has there not been really any effect from that? Oh yeah, for sure. And um, COVID-19 has brought like so many people out to Spiral Jetty. Actually, on the weekends, I don't even recommend people go out on the weekends anymore, um, but it has definitely brought more people out to Great Salt Lake. So pre-Spike um, pre 150 and kind of thinking about like this railroad causeway and like this place that we could go out to see the north arm of Great Salt Lake, we saw about 12,000 people going out there. Um, since then, it's been over about 30,000. Oh, wow. Um, so we have another question from Anne. So what's the best way for us to support water getting to the lake? I follow Utah Rivers Council and try to support their efforts, but I'm wondering if there are other avenues. So it, um, it definitely like Utah Rivers Council, Friends of Great Salt Lake, definitely keep doing that. But I mean, really, this isn't just like a like one kind of like solution. It's gonna take like like all of you know land managers, politicians, and people advocating for Great Salt Lake to really you know make any difference. And it's also gonna take some creative solutions, right? Because we all use water, and we all you know contribute to this problem. And it's gonna be you know we're gonna have to make some really hard decisions and hard changes in our lives, like getting rid of grass, conserving water, um, and changing some of our kind of wasteful behaviors to get water to Great Salt Lake. And so I don't really have like one, you know, like this is the thing that you can do. Um, I do know, so um, people, I'm gonna share my screen again with you for a minute, um, if I can remember how, cause you know how I am. So um, this, this is, um, done this um, slide that's up here was by the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council, a study um, by Jacobs. Um, it's a corporation that, that 
a consulting corporation and they looked at um, water going into Great Salt Lake and what solutions are there. And you can see that, you know, if we kind of this, this A solution, if we keep doing what we're doing, um, we're going to see less inflows into Great Salt Lake and we'll see the elevation of Great Salt Lake drop by three feet. The state um, and the governor's office just came up with like a state water strategy. And even under this state water strategy, we still lose almost two feet of water. If we were to even get more conservative about it and really innovative, um, we could probably decrease, we could stop that, you know, change in elevation a little bit. Um, or we could go on this hot growth, unfettered growth, watering our lawns, agriculture staying the way it is, and lose another 11 feet off of Great Salt Lake. And so, um, you know, every kind of every scenario that's been modeled um, with these complex models, we're still losing water from Great Salt Lake. Um, and then, I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just saw another question. So Gunnison Island, um, so somebody asked about Gunnison Island is off limits. Gunnison Island is definitely off limits to visitors. Um, um, the state, it's called a Wildlife um, Management Area, WMA, and it is managed for pelicans and gulls and even herons that are nesting out there. Um, you're not supposed to go within a mile. Um, you did see somebody that was on an ATV. They were probably looking for coyotes and bounty hunting is what we think, but um, we're not supposed to be out there. Yeah. And then um, there's a question from Cooper about if there's parts of Great Salt Lake that you can still swim. Um, there's no swimming areas that are like designated as a swimming area or swimming beach, um, but you definitely can swim at Antelope Island. You can go to Saltair, the Great Salt Lake Marina and swim, and you can even swim at Spiral Jetty. Um, the Marina and Antelope Island, um, you know, the water is about 15% salinity, so it's not as floaty as the, the hypersaline north arm. Um, you still float, your toes are still out of the water and there are showers, which is very important because um, some people, it kind of makes you itchy. And um, my husband one time was standing in the water and he said, um, don't pee in Great Salt Lake, it makes your parts hurt. And so, um, Evan. And so um, if you do swim in the north arm of Great Salt Lake, take like a solar shower that you can wash off with. Um, if your skin is sensitive, you know, maybe don't swim, but you can still swim anywhere in Great Salt Lake. It's actually where my son learned how to swim. So he was kind of scared of the water and I took him out there and, you know, it's so it makes you so buoyant that that's where he learned how to swim and become become comfortable in the water. Awesome. Well, it looks like there aren't any other questions, but um, know that we've recorded this presentation. So if you loved it and want to share it, we'll be posting that on our social media in the next couple of days. I'll also send you a brief evaluation. Um, thank you so much for spending the morning with us. I hope this inspires you to get outdoors uh, today. Sun, sun is shining, looks like it's gonna be a nice one. And hopefully we'll see you all on Saturday, May 23rd for our next, oh, there's one more question. Um, Jamie, what's the age recommendation for your book about the Great Salt Lake? Um, so it's somewhere in the like K through six range. Um, there's lots of words because we wanted to tell everybody so much about Great Salt Lake, um, but it, it is pretty simple also. So really, I, like I would say really ideal was like that fourth to sixth grade range. Awesome. And Cooper, oh, is it an ebook? It is not an ebook. However, um, uh, the book, so this May we were supposed to, um, all of our books went into every public library in the state through the Central Utah Water Conservancy District. 
Um, and because of these social distancing measures, I'll be recording it and I'll be putting like a reading online as soon as I can um, figure out how to do it. <laughs> awesome. And Cooper said, thank you. Thank you to all the Great Salt Lake nerds, and I certainly agree with that, <laughs> that statement. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.